Hey there, Popper fans, it's Brent Cook, and today I am here to share my Popper deck with you. I actually recorded a modern deck showcase earlier this morning. I'm back after watching Spider-Man No Way Home to bring you my Popper deck. So I never even played Popper until 2021, so everything you see in front of you was collected this year. And why don't we just hop right in? Oh, by the way, if you're interested in seeing more of these, there's two of these that have already been uploaded, and I'm going to upload another deck showcase every single day until the new year. All right, now we can hop on in. So let's kick it off. Reaping the Graves. When I was originally hunting for these, I could only find one or two at a time, and everyone wanted like 40 or $50 each for these, but there was a set on card market, and my good friend Callum Smith helped me get these Reaping the Graves. They were roughly $30 each, uh, which ended up being a pretty good deal at the time. I was really concerned because Haruya had them for $10 each. But then eventually when Haruya got them in stock, they bumped them up to 30. So I ended up paying what the market was on them anyway, just earlier on in time. So shout out to Calum, who actually helped me get quite a bit of this deck. Uh, because during the beginning of uh, this year, there was still shutdowns from Japan shipping to the United States. And Calum was pretty instrumental in helping me out there. So th Calum, I do appreciate you. Thank you. And then we have Songs of the Damned. So this was kind of wild. I could not find these. The first three I personally bought off of Haruya, and they were $2 each. It was like a pretty good deal. It was the last shipment I actually made before some... Um, I think I bought the first three on my own. Maybe I'm misremembering. But the first three were definitely $2 each. I remember that. Because the only reason it sticks out of my brain is that the fourth one, there was one, a single copy on Magic Card Market, and the person wanted $50. There was none on TCG, and I was like, I refuse to pay $50 for this. I eventually got the last one from Haruya, where I buy most of my cards, if I'm being honest, for $2. So I'm glad I waited that out, and now I have a set. But they need to be signed by Robbie Treveno, who is going to do a group signing with Matthew Schneider, Mountain Mage uh, Sign Cards. If you're interested in joining Matt's signing group, you can find that in the description down below. Uh, but I will be shipping those out to Matt whenever that signing happens. Cabal Ritual. I got these signed in person at Elixcon. Well, I signed, or I shipped in two originally. And then I got the last two signed at Elixcon. So if you look at these, these first two are the same signing. I believe that these were the first ones I got signed. And later on in time, I bought these two. And you'll tell that they're not exactly a matching signature. And you can tell because on these two, it's sort of a cross right here. And on these, it's an up, down, swoosh, up, down, swoosh. Uh, that's sort of how I know which signing I got them on. Little nitpicks here or there. Uh, the markers look similar enough where I feel like most people wouldn't notice it if I didn't call it out. But I've owned these for quite some time now. Um, Tim is no longer with us, so only Greg signs them. It, it was a collaboration between the two brothers. Dark Ritual. Probably the worst ritual in this deck. Honestly, Songs of the Damned and Cabal Ritual are so much more important. But Dark Ritual is still pretty useful at cycling earlier on in the combo turns. And you might be wondering, Bryant, I saw your The Epic Storm video. You have Marcadian Mask Japanese Foil Dark Rituals. Why aren't they here? I hate switching out cards. I, I, I refuse to do it. It sucks so much. So I have this backup set of Dark Rituals. Theoretically, one day I could get a second set of Japanese full Mercadian mask ones. That's not going to happen. It's just a waste of money. So these will be my Dark Rituals for Cycle Storm. Maybe they'll print another Japanese foil that I like more at some point. But I don't really like the... What art is it? I don't know. There's one that's like a guy that's red and he's like... I don't know. I don't like that art. So... Uh, we're using the Urza Saga art here for Dark Ritual. These promos are kind of cool anyway. There's a dress that's very similar that has the art that I like in it. So I don't mind these. Plus, uh, Tom Fleming was super willing to sign these very quickly. Like, they were back to me within a week after I shipped them out. So shout out to Tom Fleming. Super great artist and, uh, you know, effective signer. Lotus Petals. So I don't like swapping out cards. I would like a set of Lotus Petals signed in black. If you have a set signed in black, let me know. I'd like to buy them from you. But yeah, these aren't signed yet. There's something I'd like to get signed. It is what it is. I have a set, or well, I shouldn't. April Lee doesn't sign cards anymore, so I'd like to get a signed set is pretty much uh, what I'm trying to say there. All right, so uh, Denman Rook. I actually sent these to Denman three times over the summer. The first time I tried to send was July, I believe. And uh, they kept on getting denied from 
the Ireland uh, customs for having an oil marker in them. So I eventually shipped to Denbin, who then bought an oil marker to sign my cards. It took a while. I just got these back last month. And uh, so they were gone for roughly half the year. They're not worth much. So if I had to replace them, I could have done it. But yeah, Denman's signatures also does like pretty cool. I'm excited to be killing people in a new format with another one in a red uh, win condition. So uh, I love the Stinger. It's an emote here on this channel. If you love Stinger and you're a member, feel free to spam that Stinger emote down below. I'd appreciate that. And then we have Scott Murphy, who also did the windfalls that I shared in my legacy video. And between these two, this deck is really Dranith Tribal. These are the cards that make the deck work. Dranith Healer just got so much better once we added in Blood Celebrant to the deck, because now you can re reliably cast healers and start cycling mid combo. So that way your street rates down here are more effective. So this card's quite good. Plus it cycles for one colorless, which is just very, very strong here. So... Yeah, I love the Dranith. I can't wait for the next cycle set. Uh, I hope that they have more one mana cyclers. That's what this deck needs. Ideally, we'd find a few more to replace a couple of the creatures down below, but we'll get there. Street Wraith. Street Wraith is very powerful. Uh, the fact that it cycles for free is part of what makes this deck work so well. And holy moly, I didn't realize this, but those scans are so dark. <laughs> yeah, they look much better in person for sure. Uh, and then they're done by Cyril uh, Vanderhagen, who, from what I remember of Cyril, I own, fun fact for you, I own over 500 Grozoths from a deal I had with a friend from when I was a kid, and Cyril did Grozoth. So I had sent to Cyril a, a few times in my life before these Street Wraiths, and I contacted Cyril this year after buying the Street Wraiths uh, to sign these, and Cyril was like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'd be happy to do it, but I've moved since the last time you uh, sent to me. Because they were just outside of Boston previously, or just outside of um, Rhode Island. Uh, Providence, there we go. I remember words. Providence, Rhode Island. So they're like, oh, I'm actually living in Corning, New York, which is just like 45 minutes south of where I live now. So I was kind of surprised to find that out. And uh, Cyril is just super nice, willing to sign these. Cyril is battling cancer, I believe. So if you're interested in getting your card signed... Um, do it while you can. Not trying to be uh, mean or funny here. It's just like we don't know how long Cyril will be with us. Hopefully they're getting treatment. I don't know. But if you're interested in your sign cards, uh, they do take a little bit to get back. Just heads up. Uh, for the Broken Lands, super powerful card. A lot of people ask me why I'm still playing this card because there's other cyclers that could be playing that cycle for uh, different mana. Like theoretically, you could run four Architect of Will or architects of will because it's plural and it cycles off the island where this doesn't well the thing about horror of the broken lands is you can often just kill your opponent with it it is a big dumb beater sometimes and having that backup plan is just super super valuable so horror of the broken lands is really op i would not recommend cutting these uh and they're done by darken i've contacted darken a few times this year to get uh them signed but no response so i will be shipping these to matt schneider who is doing a signing in january i believe with darken so uh hopefully these will be scanned or signed by next year's scanning there we go i can talk and then we have imposing vantasaur i contacted uh jonathan co through their website and got no response so if anyone has a lead on jonathan feel free to let me know i'd love to get these signed they're what I found is a lot of the newer artists are more willing to sign. So uh, if anyone has information on Jonathan, hit me up. Architects of Will. Uh, Matt Stewart was willing to sign these via the mail this year. Thank you to Matt. And uh, yeah, these are probably the cards that get boarded out the most in the deck, if I'm being completely honest. They're just like kind of the worst card, but you still need a certain density of cyclers, which is why we're still playing them. It's just like, it's not... A colorless cycler which can be a little bit weird uh especially with hands with ash barons it does cycle off either island or swamp but it's not a big dumb beater a three three is not that large it's just eh. and then blood celebrant this card has really changed the way that we play this deck this year shout out to boundaries blurred or blurred boundaries in our discord i can't remember the order of that but this was their discovery and the idea is that with songs of the damned you just make so much mana that you can be able to reliably convert um, a black mana into a man of any color. And if the life loss from Blood Celebrant's an issue, you have Dihadis Ploy down here to help balance that out. And 
with that allows you to play these healers, which also gain you life to offset that life total, or the Draenid Stinger. So you, at, when you go to win the game, you don't need to have four Lotus Petals to cast these four Stingers. You just have Blood Cell Burnt to make a bunch of red mana and then, you know, start blasting your opponent to death. So yeah, a super powerful human cleric from uh, Scourge. Yeah, I, this is actually, I don't know if you can tell, the pixel quality on this is a little bit worse. I scanned this a few months ago when I sent it out to Ben Thompson to get signed and I haven't got it back yet. So hopefully it will come home to me soon. All right, so uh, Repository Scab. This is a relatively new print from Crimson Vow. The idea behind it is that it sacrifices to itself. So this is good for two reasons. When you return to Songs of the Damned, it then makes an extra mana when you go to cast songs because there's an extra creature in the graveyard. But then on top of that, you can return it with Reaping the Graves to then get back the Songs of the Damned to make even more mana. So this card is just really, really powerful in this deck. Uh, can't say enough good things about it. I did look into contacting the artist, but it looks like uh, they're in France, I believe. Mark Aronowitz, who you can also find their links in the description down below, is having a group signing in, I believe, February for uh, the repository scab, so I'll probably be sending an eight. Um, we'll see. I don't know. But uh, the card's super powerful. Mystical Teachings. Once again, Mark Aronowitz is having a signing with Ron Spears this year. I'm probably going to send these in for that. But uh, I just didn't own these by the time that the last one happened but these cards are sort of the glue of this deck they're why this deck works otherwise i've tested lists without teachings and your fizzle rate's just too high and with blood celebrant it's so easy to support multiple colors like at this point we are a true four color deck and if you want to count the white for these healers you can uh but we have red and green in the sideboard we're demir main deck so it's just you want the extra consistency that teachings provides and the blue mana really isn't that big of a deal so definitely be playing these if you're interested in playing cycle storm and then dihada's ploy this card was like a seeker upgrade from modern horizons 2 it wasn't really on people's radar until i started testing it in cycle storm where we're discarding anywhere between 5 and 30 cards in a turn so on those big combo turns it allows you to keep on cycling street wraith uh to redraw and cycle be more mana efficient so it really does play this like critical role in the deck and then on top of that the synergies with uh the blood celebrant that i mentioned previously so yeah the hottest play what an upgrade this year secret all-star so then we have the mana base down here and i redesigned this mana base this year uh so down below we'll see a bunch of invasion sacrifice lands and those were the gold standard and cycle storm for a long time and i played with those for probably half of this year if i had a guess maybe a little bit more but the problem with the invasion sacrifice lands is that you don't get consistency out of your draws you play one on turn two or on turn one you cycle on turn two on turn three you might be pressured to win so you have to sacrifice your lands and then figure it out as you go they do increase your threshold uh count quite well and they're a ritual land they do make an extra mana but i found that when i was testing out different mana bases i then switched to the mono black build that just runs four uh baron moors and then five or six swamps depending on the list and i found that the untapped velocity in that deck of cycling on turn one so double cycling on turn two triple cycling on turn three and then winning on turn four to just be so powerful and i wanted that velocity while playing multiple colors which is pretty greedy of me but that's what i wanted so i ended up settling on this list and i think it's a pretty nice compromise so we have these ash barons plus these four basics that are eight lands that come into play untapped you get that cycling velocity i wanted out of the mono black list but at the same time we get to run blue very very reliably uh we can find our island in most games and and then on top of that the blood celebrant made it so we can make red mana very easily without playing um sorry I scrolled down too far without playing something like unearth which is really popular in the blacklists the blacklists all run unearth in order to get their creatures into play which just feels a little bit sketchy at times so we're not doing any of that and instead we have a more stable mana base we have the velocity that the mono blacklist has and we get to play multiple colors so it's sort of a win-win that i sort of like figured out this mana base here is it perfect 
maybe not. I've considered running another untapped land over the fourth copy of Baron Moor. It's certainly something you could do to free up cyborg space, but I do think that this mana base is a step in the right direction. Baron Moor is obviously just a land that cycles on your combo turn. Heather Hudson uh, was great about signing these, and also these are just so nice looking. Uh, this, I'm glad the scans came out well because holy moly, like these are just beautiful. All right, so then the basics. I run Invasion Basics because that's the first set that I ever played Magic in, and I've never really quit. So I've been using these same basics for 20 years. Um, yeah, so I just love Invasion Basics. Ron Spencer is probably the only artist that I send to without emailing them first because Ron Spencer takes like over a year to get back to you via email. So the first time it took me a very long time to get a response, and then Ron was just like, don't bother emailing me again, just sign. So, <laughs> or just send them. So they're the only artists that I will just like blind mail to, but I've always had positive uh, interactions with that. Like I've probably sent to Ron 10, 12 times in my life uh, because I own like 30 or 40 of these swamps, Japanese foil, and they just always come back. I have had some friends come back to me saying that Ron signed with a silver marker. Uh, I have never had that happen myself, but I always, always send the marker that I would like Ron to sign with. So if you want them signed, in a specific way, I recommend sending those markers with Ron. Deck dividers. So in the previous two videos, you'll see a lot of the Epic Storm deck dividers, some silly cards. Well, my Cycle Storm deck, I don't have as many of those. When I built that original mini token pack, I didn't think I'd ever have a third Storm deck that I'd be playing all the time. So I have been using the RK Post tokens for this deck. Obviously, we have our Storm, our Black, our Blue, you know, all the colors of the rainbow. But then I've been using Mize for cards I've discarded that turn to help keep track of the hottest ploy, wherever that went. I scroll by it very clearly. So cards discarded this turn, and then I use Johnny Combo Player for uh, number of creature cards in Graveyard, and then I just have a D20 for all of these that I use. So that's how I've been doing it in paper, and it works quite well. So if you're interested in playing this deck, I don't think that the mini token pack is actually that great for this deck, but if you want to get the mini token pack to get your first counter for each of those and then just put your dice on top of that, I do think it's effective. That rule does not work at a competitive level REL. That said, most pauper events aren't held at competitive level REL, so I don't know if that's an issue for you or not, but if you're interested in checking that out, uh, definitely look at the Epic Storm mini token pack. Playing your favorite combo deck and paper just got so much easier with the Epic Storm Mini Token Pack. You can pick one up at theepicstorm.com slash shop for $13. It includes 64 double-sided mini tokens. That's 128 tokens total. And they include 10 black, 10 blue, 10 red, 5 green, 5 white, 3 colorless, 20 storm counters. That means that you can count your way all the way up to 20 for grape shot everyone's favorite Stormwind condition, a Galvanic Relay Exile Indicator, four treasure tokens for Strike It Rich, and then 10 monk tokens for our vintage friends. It also has Slime Time Live, Ave Progenitor Ooze tokens with the power and toughness already built in to make playing in paper so much easier. No fumbling around with dice, we've got you covered. Make sure to go grab those if you're playing modern. And then Squirrels vs. Goblins, Chatterstorm vs. Empty the Warrens, the Battle of the Ages. You definitely need 20 Squirrel tokens and 20 Goblin tokens. You're going to love this mini token pack, I promise. And once again, you can grab that at theepicstorm.com slash shop. The sideboard. Look at that, Pyroblast. These are the newer Lake Hurwitz signatures. I have the older signatures in my vintage deck, but once I saw these, I knew that I had to have them. So I got a second set of Pyroblast just to get them signed. Wow. And you might be wondering like, Bryant, why do you feel the need to play Pyroblast? You're a black deck, you could just run duress. I get this message once a week. It's a little insulting if I'm being honest. Like I couldn't figure out to play duress, am I right? Well, the big problem with that is that Spell Stutter Spray is the most commonly played counter spell in the format. Dress doesn't hit spell stutter sprite, so it creates a pretty big issue. On top of that, the number of opponents that just let Dress resolve and then reveal their hand of all counter spells is a lot. Like it happens quite a bit. So the way that you beat those decks is that you pinch them on mana because they're actually not that um fast. So they'll play like a turn one fairy and then a turn two ninja of the deep hours. Turn three they'll replay 
that fairy and they'll have two mana up. So then on your turn three, what you're looking to do is you're looking to try to win the game with a single piece of backup. So they tap their two lands to play their spell stutter. You pyroblast it, your songs of the damned resolves, and then you try to win the game. That's how a ideal or standard situation works with this deck, where if you have duress there, you just get blown out. So Pyroblast is just so much better than Dress here. I've done a lot of testing on it because ideally I wouldn't have to splash a mountain in the sideboard, but I do think that the Pyroblasts are worth it. And then obviously we have our Invasion Mountain, our Invasion Forest. That's just how I roll. Also, just look at these. They're just so nice. Look at me owning forests. You never would have thought that Brian Cook would own forests, but here we are. Uh, Flaring Pain, Glen Angus, unfortunately no longer with us. I believe Glen Angus died in 2002, very similar to Doug Chaffee in that time period. So I don't even know if Japanese foil signed uh, Flaring Pains exist. I've never seen one. Uh, so I think ideally something would be printed in the future so I wouldn't have to play this card. So I could, that, I could replace it with a card that's signed. Um, that would be the big... Uh, reason for me to want that card not my sideboard but flaring pain is just so good and it does its role so effectively so it's never going to leave my board unless we find another way of beating prismatic strands because that's the card it's here to beat shredded sails i get asked a lot of the time like why i play shredded sails and the big thing is that you can board it in against multiple decks and it's just not embarrassing so the first line of shredded sails reads uh destroy target artifact and then the second line i believe says it deals four damage to a creature with flying yes with flying so it hits spell starter sprite so you can actually use it as a counter spell against the blue deck so the blue decks tend to run one or two relic and progenitus so you can board it in there and when they go to play their spell stutter you allow it to resolve and then you kill it with the trigger on the stack and if that's the only fairy in play your spell will then resolve so Shredded Sales has this little bit of flexibility and it also cycles. So if you wanted to, you could run something like Dissenter's Deliverance, which cycles for a green, or Wilt, which you'll both see those down below. Uh, but they're just less versatile and it's a little bit embarrassing sometimes to be boarding in Disenchant effects versus blue decks. So Shredded Sales does it all quite well. Another reason why I don't love the Dissenter's Deliverance or Wilt against blue decks is then you have to board in Forest and Mountain. And I, it's just not something I want to do. So I like having the ability to board in the Shredded Sails in the same matchup as these Pyroblasts without needing the green mana source. And then down here we have Gnaw to the Bone. I did test for a long time Weather the Storm over Gnaw. And I in my mind I was like, Gnaw's not that good of a card. Come on, it can't be good. Look at it, it's three mana. Like it's just like so clunky. But then I started testing weather more and more. And I found that weather was awkward because against burn decks, I was casting or burning dark rituals just to increase my storm count to gain some life. And with Gnaw to the Bone, you're never put in that position. It actually rewards you for playing in your typical play pattern of just cycling, 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 and then eventually casting the spell that will gain you 16 life without needing to burn other resources. So Gnaw to the Bone is just terrific. Uh, I've yet to contact Scott Chow. I need to do that. If you have information on Scott Chow, hit me up. But also, like, I could probably do a quick Google search. I just haven't done the legwork yet. Um, that's the truth. My Hydroblasts are actually out being signed right now. They're with uh, Mark Ronowitz. So Lake Hurwitz did another signing with Mark. Mine are with them. I just need to get them back at some point. So these are scans from before I sent those out. Uh, but yeah, these are here mostly to deal with Atog. I think if Atog gets banned out of Popper, I'll probably not play these anymore. And then I would have another slot for Shredded Sails to not lose the Graveyard deck. So that's where these cards would go. And then our Frog, Spore Frog, and Wildy Scandark. Uh, I just got these in the mail this month. And we're testing those over Darkness. So Darkness is always good because it, you can tap a black, surprise your opponent with it. But you'd be boarding out Architects of Will, which then lowers your creature count, so it actually increased your fizzle rate sometimes. Uh, where Spore Frog, you can get it back with Reaping the Graves to get additional fog effects. But on top of that, it makes extra mana with Songs of the Dam too. So I think Spore Frog's pretty good. I don't mind boarding in the forest to make it happen if I'm going to get extra mana out of it later. Uh, I do have to get these signed by Donato. I just have to send them out. They signed via mail. And I just didn't want to do it right before the holidays, knowing that I'd be scanning everything. So that's Spore Frog, and that's the sideboard. Hey, 
you're still watching. Don't forget to like this video, leave a comment, and subscribe. If you're looking to make a purchase from Card Hoarder, TCG Player, or Amazon, and are looking to support us, you can open up our description down below, and in there you will find our affiliate links. Those same links are found on the homepage of the Epic Storm, but that's not all. We've included a Card Hoarder button on our website that will load the Epic Storm in your Card Hoarder cart to make life simple for you. And then everything else from here on out is just extra cards that I keep in my collection in case I ever want to play them. Here we have Divest and then Shred Memory. It's not Shred Memory. I can't think of the name of it now. I have it on the tip of my tongue. Uh, but it's just this card that discards any card from your opponent's hand or cycles through one. Um, I could probably look it up. I'm just not going to. But these were both failed attempts at solving the spell setter sprite problem while staying mono black. Divest hits artifacts or creatures. And then it's something memory. Definitely something memory. I just can't think of it. And now it's escaping my memory. But this is just too clunky at three man. I think if this was black black, I'd actually play it. But just being two in a block is too expensive. Grizzly Survivor. Every list when I started playing Cycle Storm played three of these on the board. And I'd play it and then it would just die to Lightning Bolt or die to Cast Down. And I was like, why am I playing this trash card in my deck? And I kept on playing it for months before I just decided to cut it. Because it was in every list and I couldn't figure out what everyone else knew that I didn't. What I determined was it was pretty much only good against exactly Tron. Because Tron doesn't actually play removal. They would just run a bunch of fog effects. <coughs> Excuse me. And they would try to prevent you from attacking with their Stonehorn Dignitary. So if this card ever connected, you could win the game. But it was just way too narrow of a cyborg card, for, in my opinion, for beating the Tron matchup. I know that they have crop rotation for Bajuka Bog, but this card stinks. I'm really not a fan of it. And then here we have uh, Vile Manifestation. It's pretty much this card, but better. So it gets plus one plus O for each creature in your graveyard cycles for two. It's an uncommon. It's never been reprinted. This is one of those cards that I picked up because they were literally 20 cents each. And I thought to myself, if this ever gets downshifted, this would become a staple in the deck. I would definitely play at least four of these in the sideboard, if not some main deck. So I'm hoping that at some point there's another cycling master set and this gets downshifted. That's why I own them. Echoing Return. I tested this a little bit after Modern Horizons 2 came out uh, because you could use it as like a poor man's reaping the grave, but it just stinks. Like it's so infrequent that you have multiple of the same cyclers and there'd be times where like you'd cast it for one mana to return one creature and it just was never good enough. So I tested it. I gave it a fair shot. It just stinks. I'll probably get these signed by Matt Stewart in person at some point. Um, Matt lives in New Jersey and I'm in New York, so we're not that far away. And I'd like to pretend to hope that there will be Grand Prix in the future, so you never know. Exhum, these are actually out being signed at the moment. Uh, this is my second set, so I'll probably post these for sale at some point. But there's uh, the stupid like when I bought these off TCG Player, they didn't mention how there's like a silver marker dot right here, kind of annoyed me. Uh, but it is what it is. I'll probably put these up on the site as like MP or something. Uh, but yeah, these were something I tested quite a bit. Down below, you'll find Striped River Winder, which was a plan that I tried for about a month because the idea was that against fairies, you put a Striped River Winder into play, and it's a 5 5 hex proof that they just have a really tough time answering. The problem with that is it doesn't trample. Not that Horde of the Broken Lands does either, but what I found was that they just block until they live long enough because it needs to connect four times. With Horde of the Broken Lands, if it connects once, it could be the end of the game. So there's that. And then Gurmag Angler being a 5-5, five five, that's usually how it uh, the Striped Riverwinder ended up dying with Exhum. So I just eventually moved away from this plan. Unearth. I actually got a pretty good deal on these. These I got off of Hauriuya. They were $40 each, where when I was checking TCG Player at the time, they were like $120. Uh, so I got a good price on these, but I don't know if I'll ever play them again after discovering Blood Celebrant. It's just Blood Celebrant's so good, you get the benefit of playing all the colors without needing to play on Earth. The Mono Blacklist might come back into favor at some point, so if it does, I'll probably want to own them. I do need to get them signed by Don Hazeltine, who's the artist who also did Reverent Silence. But uh, it's just a sweet card. I don't know how good it is anymore, but it's certainly awesome. 
And then down here we have Death Denied from Saviors of Kamigawa. And this was a card a lot of people tested for discard matchups, like the mono black decks or Orzhov uh, Pestilence, where they would discard you a bunch. And then on their end step, you would just try to cast this the hard way for four or five cyclers, three if you're in a pinch, just to get that card advantage to come back. I think that this sort of slot died with Repository Scab. Because with Repository Scab, you can get back the songs or the Reaping the Graves, and you have that ability to play a longer game without needing to play some super expensive one of that you would just have to pray to draw in the right matchups. So, probably not playing these anymore, uh, but it doesn't hurt to own them. And then down here we have Fairy Macabre. I played these during the height of Mogwarts. Um, and I did actually win a mirror with these on Magic Online once, which was kind of funny. Not these physical copies, but obviously the card in the sideboard. Uh, and, you know, it's really good for the reasons that Spore Frog is good, where it's a creature for Songs in the Damned and Reaping the Graves. It's just right now is not the right time to be playing them in the metagame with Affinity everywhere. I could certainly see myself playing these again in the future. I actually uploaded a video that you can check out in the card above where I cleaned the previous signatures off of these cards to send them out to get signed again by RK Post. So definitely go check that out if you're interested in removing signatures from your cards. Darkness. I'll be honest, I'm literally never getting these signed. Uh, Har Harold McNeil is not a great person. So that's all I'm going to say about it. I'm just not going to get these signed. Ideally, I would, I honestly, I would break my rule. If Darkness were to get reprinted uh, with different art by a different artist, I would probably get those and play those over these ones. But my rules traditionally first print Japanese foil. I'd break that rule for Darkness. So if they get reprinted, I would definitely play those. Um, why can't I think of the name of this right now? All creatures get minus one. Creatures your opponent's control get minus one, minus one until end of turn. Cycles for two. Why can't I think of it? I am so old. Uh, whatever. So I, I tested this card. I never found that. Suffocating fumes. Boom. There we go. Hope you enjoyed that loud clap. Uh, I tested this card. It was just never quite good enough. People had sided in against fairies. And it was just sort of... You're playing the wrong game if you're going after other creatures. It also doesn't even kill Ninja of the Deep Hours, which is just embarrassing. So don't play this trash. <laughs> All right, and down here we have Spinning Darkness. Not Darkness, but Spinning Darkness. And this was an idea I had where I wanted to play Mono Black with Life Gain in it. So I tested this out. If you're unaware, Spinning Darkness exiles the top three black cards of your graveyard and then deals three to a creature you gain three life. I looked at this as a way of slowing down the burn decks because you could kill their Alchemist or their Gitu Lava Runner and you know buy some time the problem is you would end up like removing creatures sometimes and that's not really what i wanted to do plus three life isn't even that good meanwhile you're watering your deck down to gain three life so this card was a little bit of a trap i would not recommend it but it's a card i played a lot of as a kid uh, because i started during invasion block like i've mentioned a million times in these videos where cards were a little bit more underpowered and this card was just like pretty good during a lower powered era Weather of the Storm. I've talked about this card already when I talked about uh, Not to the Bone. I don't really have a whole lot to say here other than they're signed by Magnali, who just does amazing art, but also a super awesome signature. I covered Wilt and Dissenter's Deliverance. I, I need to get these signed at some point, uh, but also like these Vulcan Baga signatures are just so awesome. Spore Frog again, and then Repository Scab. We covered uh, Stripe Riverwinder. Tolarian Winds was the first change I actually made to the Epic Storm myself. Um, when I was testing it, I found back with those old Sacrifice Land builds that you needed something to get through your deck that was more mana efficient post Reaping the Graves because the deck really choked on mana. And Tolarian Winds was a good card for a little bit. But once we found Repository Scab, the Tolarian Winds felt so win more because you never needed it to go through your whole deck anymore. Because Repository Scab would just return the songs and you could cycle manually. Where Tolarian Winds was awkward because sometimes you would draw double Reaping the Graves and you could never cast this. Where Repository Scab just never has that issue. Because if you draw double Reaping the Graves, it's a good thing, which is what you want. Where Tolarian Winds made that a bad, awkward situation. So I eventually moved away from them. 
I did contact Bob Petrello about signing them, but never heard back. So if you have any leads on Bob, let me know. I'm looking to get these signed. I actually picked up this flaring pane for the Chatterstorm deck because the Chatterstorm combo played two of them. So I have two flaring panes. It is what it is. They'll never get signed. But I mean, it's a sweet card for sure. Shredded Sails. I actually own four of these, but it just didn't work out with the way that I wanted the colors to end. So I only uploaded one. Uh, these are actually out being signed right now. Yeah, I've covered that. Let's move on. Flourishing Fox. Like Vile Manifestation, this card is an uncommon. It's never been printed at common, but I would like it to be. So I picked them up for 25 cents each and just waiting for the day that they get possibly downshifted. I'd have to figure out a white mana base in order to make it work, but Flourishing Fox would be such an upgrade for this deck. I really hope that happens. More copies of Dehot as Ploy. Um, another Architects. And then um, Monstrous Carabid. And yeah, it's just another hybrid cycler. We're not playing the mountain in the main deck. So ideally, I think that Carabit is actually better than Architects if you're looking for a big dumb beater. I've actually attacked with these in games, but we don't play mountain, which makes it worse than Architects. And I'd like to play these. Plus, like I have to get these signed by Pete Venters at some point, but I think it's just correct to be playing Architects right now. Uh, another card that if it's ever downshifted, we could consider playing Zenith Flare, but I've actually come to the conclusion that I don't like win conditions that aren't cyclers. Like all you really need is Stranus Stinger. You don't need Zenith Flare, uh, because at some point mid combo, this card is going to get stuck in your hand, unlike a Dranith Stinger. So you really want your win conditions to cycle. Maybe I'd play it in the board. I'm not even sure. Uh, but Zenith Flare is for consideration. I just don't know how good it actually is. That's that. Chromatic Star. I bought these this year. I got a pretty good price on them. I have to get them signed. I was testing them for a little bit as a Lotus Petal alternative. So that way you wouldn't have to play this card that didn't cycle in your deck. But it would still fix your colored mana. And ultimately I just found that not being an initial mana source was such a ding against chromatic star that it wasn't worth it it's a good budget alternative if you can't afford lotus petal stars are okay enough but lotus petal being that free initial mana source is just so good that once you start testing it you notice the difference immediately so that is chromatic star it's a fine card it's just not quite a lotus petal and then down here we have the invasion sack lands uh john avon signed these for me when i got the uh lotus field signed earlier this year and then Ed Beard Jr. just doesn't sign for the most part. Uh, Ed Beard signs at like festivals and stuff, but won't sign via mail anymore unless you buy a painting. And uh, I'm not really into art collection. And also it's a little too rich for my blood. So maybe at some point, or if you're willing to send in my cards to get signed by Ed Beard when you're buying a painting, let me know. Uh, but I would like to get these signed by Ed at some point. And then once again, another Don Hazeltine, uh, Ancient Springs, uh, more sacked lands and then down here we have our other decks that I will be uploading so if you're interested in any of these archetypes stick around I hope you enjoy them and then these are what I, what I use and recommend I am not being shilled at all or being paid to sponsor these products these are what I use I think that these are the best products you can use so the epic store mini token pack are perfect fit sleeves they keep foils flat and if that's what you're interested in definitely check these out i've flattened a bunch of different foils over my lifetime with hard perfect fits it also helps if you keep them tight in a deck box but hard per perfect fits are simply magic that's the only way to describe them i've bought super curled foils and hard perfect fits over the course of a year have completely flattened them out dragon shields just great sleeves and then the decks deck box they're what i use for everything like right here i have one uh, I use them all the time and I'm not being paid. I just think that they're the best deck boxes, deck boxes that exist. So definitely go check those out. And then silly arcade dice. And if you're interested, this is the Epic Storm mini token pack. Uh, you can use one of each for your storm, all that good stuff. Creatures discarded. Uh, there is no creature discard token. Just want to clarify that, but you could get those at the Epic Storm shop. I hope you enjoyed this, uh, deck showcase. Everything collected from this deck was done this year i've never played cycle storm before 2021 let's see what 2022 brings but i'm really happy with the progress i made in a single year on this deck i feel like i got a lot done and it's by far my favorite popper deck it's such a blast to play there's so many intricate decisions 
I love it. This deck is definitely up my alley, and hopefully it's up yours too. Thank you for watching. Have a great day, and keep storming. Hey, Brian Cook here. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe, but also follow the social media channels down below. If you want to support this content directly, I would recommend going to theepicstorm.com shop. And if you need a little bit of assistance with the Epic Storm to get to that next level, I would recommend going to theepicstorm.com tutoring. Don't worry, there's more great content coming right up.